Let's begin this Bible study service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank and praise you, Lord, for this time, for once again bringing us here, Lord, to study your word. We pray you will guide our thoughts, guide our study. We pray you will bless our efforts. We pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to us through the passages that we are looking at, O God. We pray that uh, your voice will go forth this evening, encouraging people, uplifting people, building them up in the faith. Come at this time into your mighty hands. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are resuming our uh, Bible study after a break of uh, two weeks, so... Remember, we are studying the book of Philippians, so let's go back there, Philippians chapter 1, and right now we are in verse 9 to 11, that's the passage we were looking at a couple of weeks back, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, and the subject here, or the topic here, in these three verses, verse 9 to 11, is Christian growth and maturity. Paul is praying in these verses, praying that believers will grow and mature. And I think all of us have a deep desire to grow and improve and progress as a Christian, as a believer, right? We all want to become better believers. We all want to grow We all want to progress. But the question is, how do we grow? eh? Most Christians don't really understand Christian growth. But Paul understands it. Paul is a man of revelation. He doesn't just pray for growth and, you know, maturity just like that. No, he prays with deep revelation, deep understanding. If we can understand what Paul understands, then we can pray like Paul prays. We can grow like Paul grew. We can help others to grow like Paul helped others. See, the key seems to be the understanding that Paul has, the revelation that Paul has, right? And so that's what this is about. You know, we want his understanding. We want that revelation that is imparted in these verses. We want the insight into Christian growth that these verses give so that we may grow, so that we may help others to grow. So our goal in studying this passage has been to get that understanding. You can think of that as the short-term goal. The short-term goal is to get that understanding. The long-term goal is to grow. (laughs) like this passage is talking about, right? Only if you get the understanding, you can grow and help others to grow. Now, I've already shown you that, you know, three weeks we've been studying this passage already, right? In case you missed it, you can catch up on YouTube. All the messages are freely available there. But we've already seen for three weeks how... Paul's prayer is not like most people's prayer. It is very carefully thought out. Every sentence, every word, right? It is very specific. It is very detailed. And I've shown you in the last three weeks that Paul's prayer here for Christians to grow and mature actually reveals the different stages of Christian growth, right? He seems to understand Christian growth so specifically that he seems to understand how we grow from one stage to the next. And he prays that we will grow from one stage to the next, right? So if we can display that diagram now in English, let's just run through the passage in the way Paul takes us from stage to stage. He prays that we will grow from one stage to the next, This is not just a general prayer that we will all grow and become better. No, no. It is a very specific prayer that we will start at a specific place and grow and become better and better stage to stage and reach the highest point, right? 
Uh, and so, you know, instead of the word step, stage may be better, but let's look at it. It's the, we're looking at Philippians 1, 9 to 11. Stage one is where Paul says, let the believer grow in love and knowledge and discernment. Right? Love and knowledge and discernment. So that is where, you know, we grow in knowledge from God's word. We learn about God. We learn about ourselves. We learn about this world. We learn about sin. We learn about holiness. We learn about everything, basically, from God's word. Growing in knowledge, right? Growing in love means we grow to love God more. We grow to love the ways of God more. We grow to love the people of God more, right? All of that is included. We grow in knowledge, we grow in love, and we grow, we develop a certain kind of discernment or insight. That means we are able to look at situations in life and clearly distinguish right from wrong. We are able to look at situations in life and clearly see which is the better path to take. So much so that uh, we can actually go in that better path. We can make that right choice, right? So we grow in knowledge, we grow in love, we grow in discernment, and that leads us to stage two. You can just leave the diagram up there for now. So step two is that growth in love, knowledge, and discernment will lead us to approve the things that are excellent. Now, that, that nobody talks in that way nowadays. Approve the things that are excellent. But there is so much truth there. What Paul means is, so that we may make the right choices and then come to find out that the choices we made, the will of God that we chose, was indeed the best. Approve the things that are excellent means so that you may, by personal experience, find out that God's way is the best way. The excellent things are the will of God, that you may approve the will of God, that you may approve the things that God wants or wills. You can read it like that, right? So basically, you grow in knowledge, you grow in love, you grow in discernment, so that when you're faced with practical situations in life, you choose God's will. You do God's will. And you come to find out that God's will is indeed the best. There is nothing like God's will. You prove by personal experience that God's way is the best way. That is what is involved in step two, approving the things that are excellent like uh, that word approve, right? You check something and you approve it, right? You say it's approved. In the same way, you do it and you see that it is truly good. That's the meaning there, right? I don't want to go into these things because uh, we've explained this in detail. So this will lead us to stage three. Paul says, let them grow in love, knowledge, and discernment so that they may approve the things that are excellent so that they may be sincere and without offense or pure and blameless, as some translation says, for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. So Paul is saying, the more and more you approve the things that are excellent, that is the more and more you do the will of God and see for yourself that God's will is the best, what happens? The more and more you get away from impurities, the more and more you avoid sin, the more and more you choose the holy path, the more and more you choose God's way, you become more and more pure, more and more blameless, more and more sincere, right? You stumble less, you cause others to stumble less. So there is an avoidance of sin, there is a growing in purity and so on. And on the positive side, you are filled with the fruit of righteousness, right? Filled with the fruit of righteousness. That's what we saw last week. Stage three is what we saw last week. Filled with the fruit of righteousness means you are doing righteousness and the righteousness you are doing is bearing fruit. That's what it means. You are doing good deeds 
and the good deeds you do is bearing fruit bearing fruit means it is having an effect it is producing results it is gaining a reward so for example you are reading your bible and that's a good work i think and your bible reading is bearing fruit you are praying and your prayers are getting answers right you are choosing the right friends and that is giving you a good result in life you are avoiding sin choosing the right way the holy way and you are gaining a profit a reward fruit of righteousness means you are doing righteousness and the righteousness you are doing is bearing fruit right so you can think of the growth that paul pictures almost like the growth of a tree right that image of fruit makes us think of a tree right a tree starts so small with the size of a seed that's all that's all the beginning of a tree is so small like a seed small seed that's planted into the ground and then it grows slowly you know from small to big slowly the branches and the leaves come up and and suddenly you look at it in the end it's so big and it's filled with fruit right so that that's the kind of growth that paul has in mind the believer starts small you know jesus talks about how uh, if you have faith as a mustard seed right? we all start with that kind of faith only very small faith we just barely believe in jesus we start small and we grow in knowledge through god's word we grow in love we grow in discernment insight and we grow 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 and we begin to do the will of god more and more we come to find out that god's will is truly amazing and we delight in doing the will of god more and more and uh, we start avoiding impurities and choosing the holy path more and more we become more and more pure and blameless hopefully and we are hopefully doing a lot of good works righteous deeds and our righteous deeds is bearing a lot of fruit and so lo and behold the believer who began in a very insignificant way is now having a life filled with fruit that's the image of slow kind of steady organic growth leading to a life filled with fruit that's what we've seen so far the three steps right and then the last two lines in this diagram is what we have not seen so far the last two lines in the passage says these things are by jesus christ to the glory and praise of god that is what i'm calling as stage 4 or step 4 right where paul says all this happens by jesus christ or through jesus christ and all this ends in god being glorified and praised right this amazing growth of the believer comes about through jesus christ or by jesus christ and it ends where does it end what is the final ending god is glorified and praised the glory and praise of god is the final ending of christian growth and maturity right what a revelation of uh, how, how a christian grows and matures and what a picture paul paints for us i think it's important for you to pictureize that right what a prayer to pray what an understanding to have what a growth to experience right this is the growth we all need to experience hopefully we are somewhere in this process maybe you feel like you know you are in a, i don't know some of us may feel we are in step 1 or step 2 or whatever it is right but uh, wherever you are you know this is god's plan <laughs> that you will grow from stage to stage uh, and that your life will be filled with fruit right and you know we've seen all uh, the first three stages in detail but the last stage 4 what i call it as what i what i call as stage 4 we have not seen so far the end result the glory and praise of god and also the line before it by jesus christ we have not seen that so that's what we're going to focus on today right the last two phrases of this passage 
which says that the growth comes about by or through Jesus Christ and the growth ends in glory and praise of God. All right, so let's put our focus there now. So in these last two phrases, what Paul is doing is he is giving us the how and the why, you may say. The how and the why. How does this growth happen? It happens by Jesus Christ, or some translation says it comes through Jesus Christ. And he gives us the uh, why. Why should this growth happen? It should happen so that God is glorified, so that God is praised. Why should we grow? So that God will receive glory and praise, right? How can it happen? Why should it happen? Both very important questions, I think, right? Because uh, we all want it to happen, but it's so difficult. If we're honest, the kind of growth that Paul is talking about is extremely difficult. Or let me put it like this. It is impossible to achieve on our own. It is absolutely impossible to grow the way Paul is talking about on our own. It can only happen through Jesus Christ. That's why he says it comes through Jesus Christ. And why should it happen? What is the ultimate reason or purpose for why it should happen? Why should we grow and mature as believers? Why should we become better? So that we can feel good about ourselves? So that we can become more holy? So that we can be known as good Christians? So that we can be a blessing to others? All that is okay, all that is good, all that is true. But I'm asking, what is the ultimate reason why we should grow and become more mature? Paul says the ultimate reason is that God should be glorified and praised. That glory and praise should go to God. Right? He thinks in a certain way. I want to grow not just so that I will be better, so that I'll be more holy or so that I will be more like Christ, so that I'll be a blessing to others, so that, you know, I'll be more successful in everything, so that I'll, you know, bear fruit. All that is good, but I want to grow ultimately for the praise and glory of God. My growth should bring glory to God. My growth should result in praise going to God, right? So this is what we're going to look at today, the, the how and the why. How can this kind of impossible growth happen and why should it ever happen? Or what is the ultimate reason it should happen? The how and the why. The power and the motivation. The way and the destination. The how and the why. So let's look at those two phrases. How does this growth happen? It happens through Jesus Christ. Let's look at that first. It comes through Jesus Christ or it is by Jesus Christ, right? Let's just focus on that now first. How does this happen? It comes through Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Let's just, you know, look at those words first. Coming through Jesus means or it happens by Jesus means it does not come without Jesus. Christian growth and maturity cannot happen without Jesus' help without Jesus' involvement. It comes, it happens only through Jesus' help, only through Jesus' involvement. Jesus Christ is absolutely necessary. Now, when I say that, you know, we all know Jesus is necessary and we all know he died on the cross and all that. But what I think you should realize here is not only is his death necessary, his life is also necessary. <laughs> People think, Oftentimes, you know, they, they uh, don't take the death and life of Jesus together, right? Somebody asked me, I think, you know, sometimes children ask this question. You say Jesus died so that our sins can be forgiven, right? That means he could have died and just uh, been uh, died itself. He, never, he, he didn't have risen again at all, <laughs> right? The death takes care of everything. No, that's not the way the Bible presents it. It's the death and resurrection. It's the death and life, right? This passage is focusing on Christian growth. It's not focusing on forgiveness of sins, for example, right? For a Christian to grow and become more and more like Jesus, he not only needs the death of Jesus, 
the shed blood of Jesus, he also needs the risen Lord Jesus Christ to help him every day. To give him power every day. It comes through Jesus Christ means it comes through the risen Lord Jesus Christ. It comes through the Jesus who died for us and today lives so that we can grow and mature and be like him and one day meet him and be with him for ever. It comes through Jesus Christ. A living Christ is the only one who can cause us to grow. What is it that Paul is saying comes through Jesus Christ? I think I can give two answers for that. One is all the stages of growth here come through Jesus Christ. Everything happens through. I mean, without Jesus, nothing will be there, right? In fact, the Bible says without Jesus, the world would not have been made. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything that was made was made by Him, right? Everything was made through Him, Paul says in Colossians 1. So without Jesus, first of all, nothing would have been made, okay? So that's a different story. But let's not even go there. Without Jesus, the believer would not have anything. No salvation, no forgiveness, no nothing. And no growth either, right? But Paul is mainly focusing on growth here. So let's just look at these verses and the focus here itself. Without Jesus, none of the stages of growth can happen. You cannot grow in love, for example. You cannot grow in knowledge. You cannot grow in discernment. You cannot really approve the things that are excellent. You cannot become more and more pure and blameless. You cannot be filled with the fruits of... So it applies to everything, right? Without Jesus, no stage of growth will happen. Our effort is not enough. Our prayers are not enough. It is Jesus who produces the growth, every stage of this growth. So that is one answer. What comes through Jesus? Everything comes through Jesus. Everything comes through Jesus. All the growth comes through Jesus. All aspects of the growth come through Jesus. But I can give you a second answer because here Paul is emphasizing the fruit. Actually, if you look carefully in your Bible, you'll see verse 11, right? Paul says, let them be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. So what is being highlighted here is the fruit is by Jesus Christ. The fruit comes through Jesus Christ. Everything comes through Jesus Christ, but what is emphasized is the fruit comes through Jesus Christ. And I, and I think it's worth emphasizing that because Paul is emphasizing it, you know. The fruit, even in a tree, that fruit is a real biggest miracle. <laughs> You can pour the water, you can give the sunlight, you can do this and that. You cannot make the fruit come finally. When the fruit comes, it's something really miraculous and glorious, isn't it? Have you ever thought about that? Look at a tree, right? Everything looks brown and green. And these fruits look so beautiful. <laughs> totally different from the rest of the tree. You wonder how did this fruit come from this tree? You know? Have you thought about that? In the Christian life also, you know, everything is with God's help only, right? But that fruit, our efforts having a result or an effect. For example, you pray, right? We pray with the Jesus' help only. We pray in the name of Jesus only. But after we pray, to get an answer to that prayer, that is a different level, isn't it? Right? You can pray for one hour, you can pray for 10 hours, you can pray for 10 days, I heard about a 100-year prayer meeting. <laughs> you may wonder, how is that possible? It is possible, right? 100 years, it seems one group, you know, just continuously kept praying, you know. So you can pray for 100 years, 200 years, whatever, 24 hour. The point is, all that is not going to guarantee a result. There are people who have prayed much, no result. That answer to the prayer comes only from God. Answer to the prayer only comes from God. We can pray all we want. We can try all we want. We can fast all we want. We can commit ourselves all we want. But finally, the blessing, it has to come from him. That answer has to come from him. The fruit has to come from him. 
So Paul is here emphasizing much on that fruit. The fruit is by Jesus Christ. The fruit is through Jesus Christ, he's saying. Your good deeds have an effect because of Jesus Christ. Your, your good works produce results because of Jesus Christ. We can do the will of God, right? We can preach, but without Jesus blessing our efforts, the preaching will have no effect. We can help the poor, but without Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus Christ blessing our efforts, the poor will remain as they are. No difference. We can try to uplift the downtrodden in society, but without the risen Lord Jesus Christ blessing our efforts, the oppressed will remain at the bottom of society. Right? We can do all the ministry we want, all the good deeds. It will amount to nothing without Jesus actually blessing our efforts. The fruit comes through Jesus Christ. He's the one who blesses the work of our hands, the one who causes our efforts to prosper. So what comes through Jesus Christ? Everything, but especially the fruit. Now, I want to take you to John 15 in connection with this because that's a very important passage. When you talk about fruit bearing, John 15 is one of the most important passages in the Bible because Jesus himself teaches there. The famous passage, John 15, verse 1 to 8, where Jesus uh, talks about himself as the vine and we are the branches, right? Remember that? And he talks about fruit bearing, you know. This passage is very similar in a way to our passage because fruit bearing is very important in John 15. For example, I don't have the time, but you see how many times Jesus talks about fruit. In verse 2, he talks about fruit bearing. In uh, verse 4, in verse 5, and um, in verse 6, Eight, again, he talks about fruit. Again, again, he talks about the vine and branches teaching. One of the main things about it is fruit, right? And in that passage, Jesus clearly teaches that the fruit comes through him only, similar to Paul, where Paul says the fruit comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus also teaches that the fruit comes through him. Where does he teach it? He teaches it in, in, for example, verse 4. Look at verse 4. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then again in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So those words are very strong. Without me, you can do nothing. He's talking to believers. Without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Without Jesus, we cannot bear fruit. Without Jesus, all our efforts are in vain. Fruit in this passage has the meaning of general effectiveness in Christian life. Generally itself, without the help of Jesus, we we will only be ineffective in the Christian life. We cannot have any effectiveness without Jesus. Without him, we can do nothing. In verse 4, he says, unless the branch abides in the vine... You cannot bear fruit, right? The picture is very simple. Unless the branch, that is us believers, is connected to the vine, that is Jesus, the branch cannot bear fruit. Believers cannot bear fruit. It is only through our connection with Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, eh? not a Jesus who died and remained in the grave, the risen Lord Jesus. Only a connection with the risen Lord Jesus will allow us to bear fruit fruit, right? And Jesus also teaches in this passage how the fruit comes. He gives more detail than Paul, for example, right? So how does the fruit come? He says, abide in me, right? It comes by abiding in Jesus. He says it in verse 4, abide in me and I in you, right? And then again in verse 5, he says, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. The one who abides in Christ bears much fruit. It's a beautiful picture. What does it mean to abide in Christ? Because only if we abide in him, we can bear fruit. What does that mean, to abide in him? Right? That's, that gives us a very beautiful picture of uh, Jesus' role and our role. 
in this fruit bearing process right because if it, the power to bear fruit comes only from the vine from jesus so he is the one giving the power to bear the fruit but unless the branch is connected to the vine unless the believer is connected to jesus the power cannot come right so jesus role is to give the power to bear the fruit or the ability to bear the fruit and our role is to abide in jesus what does it mean to abide in him that means to stay with him to remain with him that word abide means to remain with or stay with that means you come to jesus and you stay right there you don't come and then go away you stay with him you stick with him right you stay close to him that's what abiding means and uh, it's not just a kind of sentimental uh, thing sometimes that the abiding is taken very sem- sentimentally i'm just abiding you know or it's taken very uh, passively huh? abiding means i just rest and i do nothing no it's not like that right i'm just abiding you know like floating in the clouds with jesus or something no no it's not like that right abiding means you notice that it's actually a command abide in me did you notice that the way he puts it is a command abide in me and i in you eh? it's very interesting because uh, no gardener is going to go and command a branch to abide in the vine right but jesus is using the vine and branches illustration but then he is doing something weird he's saying abide in me as though we have the choice to abide as though it's up to us to abide as though it's something we can do the branch cannot choose but believers can choose to abide the believers can do something it is something the believer must do it is an active thing not a passive thing it is something that involves a lot of effort from us sometimes right what kind of effort is involved there i think abiding in jesus includes a lot of things that means keep believing in jesus how do you bear fruit keep believing in jesus keep loving jesus keep obeying jesus keep fellowshipping with jesus keep living for jesus right notice i say keep 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 because that's the idea of abide you keep on close with jesus right so that notion of abiding again i said to you is a beautiful picture because it shows jesus's role and our role we are not the ones who are producing the fruit it is jesus but we have to keep with him close to him if you stay with him if you stick to him you will bear fruit you will bear fruit you can think of it like this if you, you hold on to him and keep on holding on to him you will bear fruit how do you do that how do you abide <laughs> how do you stay close to jesus right again when we say things like that stay close to jesus people take that sentimentally right no no how do you how do you stay close to jesus right the the main way you stay close to jesus is by his word right in that passage itself he says in verse 7 if you abide in me and my words abide in you if you abide in me and my words abide in you right so abiding in jesus is connected with jesus's words abiding in us so it's basically you know sitting with him listening to his words doing what he says right he says if you love me you'll do my commandments so we do his commandments that only shows that we love him so we we he said hey, believe in me right believe in god you believe in god believe also in me he said so we believe his word we we trust his word we we do his word we stay close to him in that way this is the main way you can stay close to jesus right when you listen to his word when you do his word 
And when you show your love to him in that way, you cannot be without bearing fruit in your life. You cannot be without bearing fruit in your life. You cannot be without growing as a Christian, right? The growth that Paul talks about in Philippians 1, 9 to 11 is impossible to achieve on our own. It can only happen through Jesus. But what is our role? Our role is to stay close to him. What does that mean? That means we listen to his word, we obey his word, we love him in that way. Right? And we keep on doing that. We keep on staying close to him. When that happens, the growth will happen. You will progress in your holiness, obedience, in doing the will of God, choosing and delighting in the will of God, so on, right? It will happen. It will happen, right? Your role is to abide in Christ. Stay close to him, see? J.I. Packer, great uh, scholar, you know, he says, the holiest Christians are not those most concerned about holiness as such, but those whose minds and hearts and goals and purposes and love and hope are most fully focused on our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying the way to become more holy is not to focus on holiness. The way to become more holy is to focus on Jesus. Right? Focus on Jesus. Right? This is not just a self-improvement. Right? Every, even the world teaches, you know, become a better version of yourself. Christianity is not like that. Christianity says you come to Jesus, stay with Jesus. You will become a better version of your, <laughs> you know, it's totally different. You will be transformed, but it happens by coming to Jesus and staying with Jesus. The fruit comes through Jesus Christ. The growth comes through Jesus Christ. The maturity comes only through Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's that first statement. This growth comes through Jesus Christ. I think that should encourage every person. Right? If Paul's prayer looks impossible to you, if the kind of growth Paul's talking about looks so you know, difficult, how am I ever going to reach that stage pure and blameless? You know? How am I ever going to you know, uh, be filled with the fruit of righteousness? Doing righteousness itself is difficult. Then being filled with the fruit of righteousness, how am I? See, that's the, that means we're focusing on the wrong thing, right? Paul says, this fruit only comes through Jesus Christ. This growth only comes through Jesus Christ. So, we should keep it simple. <laughs> Stay close to Jesus. Intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ will produce everything. Intimacy how? Through his word. Intimacy through his word. The path to growth is not by techniques. It's not by doing, you know, here are 10 steps, you do it. and uh, No, it's not like that. Right? It's, it's very complicated. Growing is a very complicated matter. Christian growth and maturity, becoming more like Jesus, again I say to you, is impossible. <laughs> but it happens by staying close to Jesus because when you stay close to him, when you abide in him, he supplies the power. Like the vine supplies the power to the branch, the sap, the life. Jesus supplies the power, the ability, the interest, the motivation, everything he supplies. You make an effort to stay close to him by reading his word, by listening and trying to do his word. Huh? By loving him, by trusting him, right? So, I think that gives me great encouragement because on the one hand, I look at Paul's prayer and it looks like, will this ever happen? But on the other hand, I see that last, second to last statement, it comes through Jesus Christ and I'm encouraged. It's not something I produce, right? Becoming more and more holy and becoming like Jesus is not something I achieve. Bearing the fruit of the Spirit is not something I do. It is something Jesus does in and through 
me. So, if you look at it that way, anyone can grow <laughs> into the person that Paul is talking about. Anyone can become more like Christ. Simple way is stay close to Jesus through his word. All right, so let's move on to the next statement, the final, final phrase in Philippians 1, 9 to 11. Let's go back, Philippians 1, 9 to 11. The final phrase is, all this is to the glory and praise of God. Paul is praying for all this growth from one stage to the next, that finally we'll be filled with fruit, like a tree is filled with fruit, that our life will be filled with fruit, and he says, all this is to the glory and praise of God. This is the grand result of Christian growth and maturity. This is the final ending, so to speak. The glory and praise of God. The final ending, the result, the grand result is not we become holy. The grand result is not just that we live a victorious Christian life. The grand result is not just that we are blessed and we are a blessing to others. All that is true, but that's not the highest result. It's not the grandest result, shall we say. It's not the ultimate ending. The ultimate ending is we become holy, we become blessed, we are blessing to others, and all this leads in the glory and praise going to God. That is the ultimate ending. That's why Paul puts it last. We have a practice, right? Whenever we pray a prayer, what do we say last usually? We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. You should not think that's a formula. Even though sometimes we may say it like a formula. <laughs> There's a reason it has become like a formula. See, these traditions all come from a good place. We lose the meaning of the tradition sometimes. But there's a reason it comes last in the prayer. Because everything should be ultimately for his glory. Right? What is the highest reason for anything? What, what is the reason you exist, for example? Or what is the reason the world was made? What is the reason for the sun, moon, and the stars to exist? What is the reason for the smallest, tiniest insect in the Amazon jungle to exist? For the glory of God. Ultimate, that's the ultimate answer you can give. That's the ultimate answer to the why question. Why do I exist? Why do you exist? Why does this church exist? Why are we teaching today? Why have you come here today? See, if I say, why have you come here, you may say, to learn something. But why learn something? You may say, well, I, I want to learn how to grow as a Christian. Well, why? Why do you want to grow as a Christian? Well, I want to become better. You know, why do you want to become better? Because I want to be like Christ. Why do you want to be like Christ? Well, well I want to be a blessing to others. Why do you want to be a blessing to others? <laughs> we can keep going every time. The ultimate answer for the why question is so that God will be glorified. That's the ultimate answer for everything. Why should you get married? <laughs> well, I want to settle in life. Why? I want to have children. Why? So that we'll be happy. Why? The answer to everything, I challenge you. This makes life, life a little simple. You see, you don't have to know everything about everything in life. In, as a Christian, as a believer, if you know some important things, you, you can have a great clarity about life. Why should you do something? Simple rule. <laughs> Does it glorify God? Or not. That's it. You want to know the will of God? Should I go like this or like that? Which way glorifies God more? <laughs> Why should I build a house? Why should I own a house? Well, I want to save on rent money. Oh, is that the reason? Is that the highest reason we can think of? Well, I want to have a house to my liking. Is that the highest reason we can think of? Well, I want my children to have some property. Is that the highest reason we can think of? For the Christian, the ultimate reason to do anything in life is that God will be glorified. God should be glorified. You know, with this one simple thing, you can look at all your life and see what, what is you know, happening according to God's will and what is not. Where are you following God's will and where are you not? 
the ultimate reason for the existence of anything from the smallest insect to the highest king is ultimately god should be glorified ultimately god should be glorified see and so that applies to everything why do we pray for anything ultimately god should be glorified why is paul praying for christians to grow and mature ultimately it's not about the christians becoming nice ultimately it's about god being glorified when you understand the importance of the glory of god it will simplify life for you <laughs> life itself kind of becomes simple i don't have to know everything about everything i know the answer to why <laughs> the ultimate answer for the glory of god why do why should i grow not just so that i should become holy not just so that you know i should be blessed and victorious in my life not just so that i can be a blessing to others not just so that i can help others through it all god should be glorified and praised right god should be glorified and praised that's what happens doesn't it when a person grows according to what paul describes in philippians 1:9 to 11 god will be glorified and praised right yes or no you think so when a person grows in love knowledge discernment when he when he does the will of god and delights in doing it when he becomes more and more pure and blameless when he becomes filled with the fruit of righteousness when a believer's life comes to the point where he is just so fruitful god will be glorified and praised right the glory and praise will go to god let's think about that what, what does it mean to say god will be glorified what what, what happened you know think about that you have to pictureize things you know we we use this oh we give you all the glory honor and praise god you be glorified we say it so often we sometimes don't even think what it means what does that mean what does it mean when we say god is glorified right that means first of all god is the one in the spotlight god is the one who has the focus you know spotlight right now the lights are on me right when god is glorified the lights are not on me the lights are on god so to speak it it's like uh, you know this last stage in the prayer of paul shifts the spotlight from the believer to god doesn't it the whole prayer is about the believer growing but the last line suddenly the camera moves the spotlight shifts now it's all god in up to this point the the focus has been on the believer you know paul is praying for the believer to grow from one stage to the next reach the highest point and all that and if you see the highest point is already reached in step 3 itself stage 3 itself when the believer's life is filled with fruit already that's the highest point see when a tree is filled with fruit we think of that as the climax right we think of that as the highest point for the tree's growth don't we tree starts small grows 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 finally one day you go and you see it full of fruit you think of that as the highest or the maximum point of growth for the tree right it has fulfilled its purpose that's it so the believer's growth reaches the kind of final stage in the fruit itself right it looks like the prayer is over <laughs> looks like uh, the last scene has been shown right if you think of a movie right sometimes you're watching a movie and you think the last scene has already come but then suddenly they show another scene it's like that paul is continuously focusing on the believers growth and the final scene appears to be the believers life filled with fruit and you think it's all over and then suddenly the camera moves from the tree to the gardener <laughs> the camera and the spotlight moves from the tree to the owner of the garden right paul moves the spotlight from the believer to god that's the last scene he wants us to see right not the beautiful tree filled with fruit but the amazing gardener who made it all happen right the gardener the owner of the garden the one who planted the tree and watered it and made it to grow and 
cause the fruit to come. Spotlight shifts to him. Right? The better the tree, the more beautiful the tree, the more fruit it bears, the more it shifts the spotlight from itself to the gardener. Isn't that amazing? Right? <laughs> If the tree is uh, not so great, spotlight will go in a different way, you know. The, you know, the gardener is not glorified. The gardener is humiliated, shall we say. But when the tree is full of beautiful fruit, and when the believer's life is filled with fruit, the focus moves away from the believer. Focus goes to God. At that point, the believer just becomes a showpiece, that's all. Or shall we say, mirror to reflect the glory of God. An instrument through which God's glory is seen, right? When our lives are filled with fruit, people see us, but more than seeing us, they see God. They see God. They may be amazed by us, but not for long. Then they stop thinking about us. And they start asking, how did this guy be like, have become like this? You know, who does he worship? What does he do, you know? Where does he get this power from? Where does he get his influence from? Where does he get his success from, right? And they are led to our God. They realize it is God is the, who is the one who blessed our efforts and made us what we are. We kind of fade into the background and God takes the spotlight. Right? God is the one who is praised, right? If you see a tree filled with beautiful fruit, You are not going to praise the tree, are you? No. You're going to find that owner and say, what a beautiful tree you have in your garden. And the believer's life is filled with fruit. God is the one who is praised. God is the one who is praised. How great must this God be? How wise must this God be? How powerful must this God be? Say, to take a good for nothing sinner <laughs> under the power of the devil a slave to sin save him wash him cleanse him teach him lead him be patient with him cause him to increase in knowledge and love insight and discernment be patient while he's making the wrong choices and slowly lead him to make the right choices slowly you know lead him to appreciate the excellent things in life how patient god is with us right how patient he waits for us to change doesn't he truly the praise must go to god and god alone You know, I mentioned earlier that the ultimate reason for everything in this world is that God should be praised. God should be glorified. That is the ultimate reason for everything. Or we can, I can say it like this. The ultimate reason for anything to exist is that so that through it you can see the glory of God better. Through the sun, moon, and the stars, you can see the glory of God better. Through the ocean, you can see the glory of God better. But the best showpieces for God's glory are not the sun, moon, and the stars. Did you know that? The best showpieces are who? is us, right? Psalm 8, my father preached on it a couple of weeks back and, you know, to our eyes, to the psalmist's eyes, the sun, moon, and the stars look amazing. The moon and the stars, right? Creation, nature, the waterfalls, the, you know, these, some of the scenes you see, the mountains, the rivers, the valleys, you're just amazed by its beauty, right? But when you look in the mirror, we are seldom amazed, Ah, we see, we think, wow, oh, what is this, you know. But actually, the way God intended it for it to be is 
we should be the best show pieces for his glory even the sun which shines so brightly was not created in the image of god only we were created in his image right that means what if i make an image of myself when you see that you should see me right god made many images of himself see the image you should see god right when you see man you should see god through man you should be able to see the greatness and the glory of god but that's not the way it is why because of sin because we exchanged the glory of god for glory of inferior things and god redeems us from that state takes us back to the original state where we can again start showcasing or displaying his glory we can again start being a showpiece for his glory how does that happen how do you again showcase god's glory <laughs> it is through transformation of our lives the best way to see the glory of god is not to see the creation but is to see a transformed life that's the best way right in fact even god's glory is more seen in his beautiful character than in his mighty power right i don't have time to show you but even in the scriptures the thing that makes god most glorious is not his mighty power even but his beautiful character like his mercy kindness truth right for example when moses said show me your glory he came and showed him his beautiful character he said i am of a god uh, merciful and gracious slow to anger abounding in goodness and truth i keep my love for a thousand generations i forgive iniquity transgression and sin but at the same time i will do justice i will not <laughs> let the guilty go unpunished right it's the character of god that shows forth his glory in the greatest way and the only creation who can show that kind of character is us that's why this transformation is so important that's why you know our growth as a believer is so important god has chosen to show forth his glory more through our transformation than he has chosen to show forth his glory through the mountains the rivers and the valleys and the sun and the moon and the stars we are his chosen show pieces our goal in life should be growing to the point where people see less and less of us and more and more of god when they see us they should see god the beauty of god's character the beauty of god's love see that's the final ending of christian growth and maturity the believer every believer needs to grow to the point where their character displays the character of god the love of god does this ending motivate you <laughs> does the glory of god motivate you you know we all need motivation right to get up in the morning we need motivation what is our motivation what is our motivation to grow as a christian what is our motivation to become more holy or more pure and blameless more more filled with the fruit of righteousness well, what is the motivation is it just that uh, we want to become more holy pure we want to be more successful in everything we want to be more powerful we want to be a uh, blessed and a blessing right what is our highest motivation what is our highest driving force 
it should be the glory of god that is why paul prays let all this be to the glory and praise of god see why do we want even the good things why do we want even the spiritual things very important it's not enough to want the spiritual things it's important to want it for the right reason right this itself is a test you know no an unbeliever will never say i want to you know build a house for the glory of god have you ever heard that kind of notion <laughs> i want to get a good job so that god will be glorified and praised who says that that itself is a clear test <laughs> only believers have this kind of motivation driving force right i want to do this because ultimately through this god will be glorified and praised this itself is a good test for ourselves what is the condition of our spiritual growth and health right does god's glory get us excited <laughs> does the thought of god being glorified and praised in and through my life excite me motivate me drive me pray that god will create in you a passion for his glory i think we can all pray that that god will create in us a passion for his glory you know that's that's one of the main things that set jesus apart he was passionate about god being glorified pray that god will create in you a passion for his glory pray that it will become the deepest motivation in your life when god's glory motivates you more than anything else you see that will take you far in life that will cause you to grow right when god's glory motivates you to pray motivates you to get up in the morning motivates you to go to work and do a good job motivates you to raise your children well motivates you to you know <laughs> come to church god's glory god's glory god's glory god should be glorified that's the final result i want that's the final ending i look towards i long for when that is true of your life my friend nothing can stop you nothing can stop you pray let us pray that god will create in us a passion for his glory when we are driven by god's glory that is when we will be most fulfilled in life now it's like the moment you became a believer god changed your engine you know like like you buy a car right some cars run on diesel some cars run on petrol right it's like uh, an unbeliever's engine so to speak runs on self glory why do they want to get the nice job so that they can earn a lot of money make a name for themselves stand up in society everybody will praise them that's the reason <laughs> why do they want the good house the good family the good children ultimately it is self glory man seeks his own glory that's part of man's engine it's tuned that way <laughs> ever since uh, adam fell when you become a believer god changed your engine so to speak <laughs> now you are tuned to run on god's glory driven by god's glory that's how god has tuned the believer and so the more and more you give priority to god being glorified in your life the more and more you will find success in your life the more and more you will find fulfillment in your life it's like putting the right fuel in the engine we cannot be like the people in the world driven by their motivations we can want some of the same things good job good family good house good this good that it's all, you can desire all of that and pursue all of that as long as you pursue it for the glory of god all right let's all stand up and that is why we pursue christian growth and maturity we want to become more and more like jesus christ so that god will be praised when people look at us god will be praised they will see the glory of god reflected in and through our lives thank you lord we praise you we worship you oh god we pray lord that you'll create in us a passion for your glory lord 
We pray, Lord, that you will give us that passion that it is in Jesus himself, that passion to glorify your name, O God. May that be the main driving force of our life. May that be the ultimate reason why we do anything or why we don't do anything. Lord, may it simplify and clarify and lead us in the right direction in our lives, O God. May every aspect of our lives, our work, our family, our children, our anything, may glorify you. We pray, Lord, that you will give us this growth that only you can give through your son, Jesus Christ. That you'll make us more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness so that your name will be glorified, praised. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.